praise God for another opportunity to be together with you here in the house of the Lord. Uh, you, everybody had, a, uh, everybody else had a problem trying to find your key. Sometimes you know how your key get away from you. What? Maybe it's just me. Anyway, I praise and worship Him anyway. So this week, if you've been with us uh, for four days, we had experience called when men worship, and so for four nights we had men uh, praising and honoring and worshiping God, and that's in some ways we think of as strange that we think of worship as something that that women do, and I think that's a mistake. And uh, a proper understanding of worship and the power of worship and its ability to bring transformation into our situations and our circumstance is hugely important. And so today, I want to talk to us about worship. And we're actually going to use the examples of three men who found themselves in interesting and difficult, challenging situations. But because of their worship, they were able to thrive even in the middle of the challenges. And much like today, we continue to find ourselves locked in the middle of this pandemic situation as much as we, uh, you know, we're excited that there's a vaccine and so forth, but it continues to wear, at least it continues to wear on me. And as we've been going through the series and I've been studying, the God's been reminding me of some things that encourage and uplift and give me the strength that I need in the difficulties of our moment, particularly as a leader, when you feel the weight of not only uh, your own situation and your own family, but also those who you're responsible for, whether it's with regard to the church or the other ministries that we have and then the community work. And so the weight that leaders have, and many of you, if nothing else, you have to lead yourself. And so the weight of leadership, we need something to help us in order to strengthen our understanding and our ability to deal with life and its challenges. And so this morning, we want to talk about worship. As the third part, when we talked about prayer, we talked about fasting. This morning, we want to integrate worship. And I want to encourage you to get your notebooks out, get a pen out. The Lord is going to share some good stuff. I'm going analog today. Anybody remember these? Anybody want these? Maybe try. If you got one of these in the house, go check it out, right? Go analog. <clears throat> if you, digital's fine, but if you got, if you got a paper version, let's, let's, let's go analog for today and see what the Lord has to say. Sometimes it's good to touch it and feel it and hold on to it and turn pages and stuff. So it's good to have options. But let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity, Lord God, again to handle your word, to share the good news of the gospel of the kingdom with your people. Father, remind us that your word is the constitution of the country of which we are a part. You tell us, Lord God, when we surrender our lives to you, we become citizens of the kingdom of God. We are rescued, delivered from the dominion of darkness. Our former king, Satan, is no longer our boss. He no longer has authority in our lives. We become citizens of the kingdom. And most importantly, you teach us in your word that we become children of the king. And so this conversation this morning, Lord God, help us to remember that ultimately worship is rooted in our relationship with you. And so, Father, I ask that you give me the ability to articulate this word with clarity, with precision, and with power. Lord God, not deviating from the right nor the left, but being accurate with regard to the truth found in your scriptures. So, Father, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do today as you open up your heart and your mind to us around this issue of worship. And we pray this prayer now in the name and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. So we're talking about the power of worship. We're doing these seven disciplines. I don't even know what discipline we're on right now, but disciplines are habits. And it's important to realize we're actually not creatures of discipline. Discipline is extra effort applied to get us to develop habits. Because why? We are creatures of habits. I bet you you get up every day and more or less do the exact same thing. You brush your teeth with your, 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 uh, the whatever hand you use, your right hand, your left hand. You put the toothpaste on with the same hand. In the shower, you probably wash the same body parts. And we do routines. Have you ever even driven maybe to work or and you find yourself at work, and you don't even remember getting there, you, you don't remember taking that route, you remember driving, right? Or, you, or you're dressed and you don't remember like, man, I don't even, because why? You don't even have to think about it. Why? Because it is a habit. And so the goal of discipline really is to help us to master ourselves in ways such that our discipline moves us into habit. And so if we live and learn to live kingdomly as a habit, as a we'll talk about it in a minute, a lifestyle. It connects us properly with God and it enables us to experience the abundant life that God designed for us from the beginning of time. 
And so this morning as we talk about, um, we're talking, we'll go into this conversation about worship. It's important. We've talked about prayer. And if you remember, in the kingdom, prayer is an invitation for God's intervention into our situation. God has given us the world. Matthew, no, I'm sorry. It's Proverbs, no, Psalm 8 and 6. He reminds us that God created the earth and then he gave us the keys. He says, the earth is mine, but I'm giving you the responsibility for it. Psalm 115 and 16. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he's given to the children of men. And so the earth and the conditions in our own lives, the conditions around us, we're in school, at work, our neighborhoods, those situations are actually our responsibility as citizens of the kingdom and as representatives of Jesus Christ on the earth. Our responsibility to bring the influence of the place from which we hail, the country from which we're from, that responsibility on, is on us to bring that there. And so when we find ourselves in a situation where we are overwhelmed or we just are going to start our day, we say, God, I don't know. I can't handle this. And we'll talk about my guy Jehoshaphat this morning, introduced to you to him a couple weeks ago. But we get up in the morning and we pray. We say, God, I need your intervention in my work today. I need your intervention in my parenting today. I need your intervention in everything that's going to happen today. God, come alongside me. I realize that I am responsible, but I also can ask for your intervention. I remember my, my oldest daughter was just learning how to put her, her coat on, and she was struggling, struggling. She said, Daddy, I, I need some help. I told her, go ahead and do it. Let's see what you got. And so she kept struggling, but eventually she was able to take the, the coat off herself. And from that point forward, she never needed help again. And so I would intervene as necessary, but one day I was confident that she had the ability to take that coat off by herself, and I let her struggle a little bit. But then from that moment on, she was able. And I don't know about if, you, if you've ever taught someone, you taught a, a, a child how to tie their shoes. Right? And it's the greatest struggle in the world. Tying your shoes, you think it's just such a deep thing, right? That's why they invented Velcro, so we don't have to do shoe tying. But you teach the kid how to tie the shoe. And once they learn, guess what? From that point forward, you never have to teach them again. And so God allows us to struggle. He intervenes at the level of our need. Because there are sometimes, like we, anybody, you, you learn how to ride a bike. Or somebody taught you how to ride a bike. And you're, you're following, and you're holding on to the seat. And you're like, go, go. And you're acting like you're still back there. And at some point, you let go of the bike. And the kid is, is pedaling on themselves, and then they realize that you're not long, no longer back there, and you probably, that's when they wreck and fall that first time, right? But then, after that point, when they were like, Daddy and Mommy is no longer holding the bike, but from that point forward, they mastered it. They understand how to balance it. And so God gives us, as we grow, we ask for his help, and he comes alongside, but then he matures us. And then situations that used to bother, listen, there are things that five years ago you would have lost your mind if they happened. But if you've been growing in your relationship with God, when that same thing happens, you don't even get pressed. You're like, come on, Satan, you got to do better than this, man. <laughs> you got to come better. With it. I've seen this one before. God has shown me that I am more powerful than this. You ever talk to yourself? You say, come on, self. You're not going for the okie doke, not this one. Right? And so you mature and you grow, but we ask God for his intervention. And then when we fast, it says, okay, God, I'm serious. I'm going to take away something that I like, something that's pleasurable, my food. I'm going to put that on hold for a minute. And I want to focus and I want to hear your voice. I want to dig more deeply. And so fasting and prayer, they go together. When we get focused and we really need God's intervention. And so this morning we're talking about the third key in this. And this really is about our relationship with God. It's about establishing and strengthening and growing in our relationship with him. And so this morning we're going to talk about worship as an individual and corporate response to situations and circumstances in our life. Some things will happen to us individually, and we'll learn that through worship, we hear God's voice. God carries us through. And often, he doesn't deliver us from situations, but he takes us through them because he's using them to grow us. And so it's important that we are rooted and grow in our relationship with God. So the question this morning that we'll start with is, what is worship? And when we think of worship, when I think of worship, perhaps oftentimes the first thing that comes to mind is singing, right? Or clapping, or shouting, or, or, or dancing, or maybe even crying, or even giving, presenting our offerings to God. And so in, in the scriptures, the word worship often applies to bowing down. But it's deeper than this, that it really encompasses the whole set of our relationship with him. And in fact, worship is a lifestyle. 
Worship is a lifestyle of praise and adoration of God that encompasses our words, our walk, and our resources. It encompasses our words, our walk, and our resources. Are y'all taking notes? You taking notes out there? You taking notes in here? It encompasses, you're going to need this. Worship encompasses a lifestyle that encompasses holistically our words, the way we carry ourselves, our walk, and it even impacts our resources. Worship is not an event. Now, there can be an event in which worship takes place. You see, and oftentimes people get them confused. We go, well, I'm going to worship. And so does that mean if you're not physically gathered in a church building, quote unquote, that then worship can't happen? Is this physical place? Because and we asked a couple, it's been almost a year ago now, I said, imagine with us when the pandemic first struck. I said, imagine if we couldn't return for a whole year. Y'all remember this conversation? It's like, what if we couldn't come back? for a whole year? And at that point, it was just, I was just kidding, frankly. Where I was like, all right, let's just pretend. Let's, let's, let's do a mind experiment. What would we do? Now, that question has become very real. I had a conversation uh, last week with a friend, and we were talking about um, returning to worship or not returning to worship and so forth. And so uh, because we're online, so as he says, you know, sometimes it feels like it's just another Zoom meeting. I think I mentioned this last week. Just another Zoom meeting. Wow. So that says to me, that's why this topic of worship is our discipline that we're talking about this morning, because if we feel that worship, corporate worship, it's just another Zoom meeting. Or if the enemy has tricked us into believing that our gathering together, whether it's face-to-face or whether it's online together, that that is the meaning of worship, then we have a serious problem. And the enemy desires to deceive us, but worship is literally getting in the face of God, being in relationship with the creator of the universe. And so I think, again, I mentioned last week that Even if you're worshiping at home, I encourage you to set aside that time and not, you know, eating your pancakes, not unbraiding or rebraiding the baby's hair, you know, not doing your your taxes or or, or writing notes while you're there, right? Because the truth of the matter is, and I'm going to tell you, when when we were pre-recording the service and we were home, I was like, I'm loving this, sitting on the couch, feet propped up, and I was watching worship as opposed to being active participant in communicating and being in relationship with the creator of the, I mean, it should blow our mind the fact that we get to spend time with the creator of the universe. I mean, think about whoever you think is important or valuable or whatever, maybe you're you're uh, uh, some athlete or some entertainer or some entrepreneur or some, there's somebody who you think is important. And somebody, you can't just imagine, like, man, if I got a call at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they said, I want to meet you there. But some of you, I don't know if you, 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 you maybe a Beyonce called you or something. Like, oh, I want to be there. Or, or, I don't know who y'all like, uh, Tom Brady. I know one of us love Tom Brady. If Tom Brady <laughs> said, Justin, I want to meet you, Justin would get up and go see Tom. See what I'm saying? <laughs> There, so whoever matters, to, we're talking about God, people, the creator of the universe. And I remember as a child, Sunday morning was a big deal. Now, the, I mean, you know, again, for better or worse, now some of it was about to close and seen, being seen and all that. But there was a discipline and there was a habit associated with preparation for worship. And so you got your clothes out. You had to pick out what you were going to wear. And then you ironed. Your clothes, you ironed your shirt, you ironed your suit, your dress, or whatever needed to be done. And my dad and I, we would, he would get out his little, little shoe box and get that kiwi out. And, you know, you get the kiwi and the little rag and put it on your shoes and then buff and shine your shoes. And so this was a ritual. So every Sunday, Saturday was preparation for Sunday. I remember my grandmother, she would cook her meals and prepare her food in advance. So she would just have to warm it up on Sunday. But the preparation, the mindset that I'm going to go and worship God, I'm going to spend the day. And y'all remember, it was a day. <laughs> it was the whole day, right? You get up in the morning, you have service. And then there was the afternoon service at somebody else's church. And then you would go and sing. And what would you sing? Not one song, but you would sing what? An A and B selection. And if it got good, they, y'all sing one more song, right? So it was an A, B, and C. 
And then about that time, and then you, they would feed you, which was great. Of course, now then the itis said, in, you tired? You think you're going home? You ain't going home. You're going back to church. Because why? We got evening service. Y'all don't remember YPWW. It was Bible Band or YPWW or whatever it was, right? And then you came back, and you were back at church for 630, and then you'd have service all over again. And so all day <laughs> was spent worshiping the Lord. And maybe the Lord got some word. Maybe some of it you just like, oh, my. Here we go again, right? But God was the focus. That's the point. He was the priority of the day. And today, and particularly, I think, with the online situation, it's just like, listen, I'm going to take a little time while I'm doing something else. Maybe I catch this early. Maybe I catch the rerun. But there's something powerful about corporate worship, getting together as a family, even online to see other people on the chat or whatever it is, getting together and spending dedicated, devoted time to worship God. And so worship, not an event. Worship reminds us of who God is. You remember, and for me, particularly in the, the pandemic moment, I realized that I got away from worship and music in particular. So when you sing those songs and, you know, growing up in the church, and there's some songs were just entertaining. Other songs were just powerful. There are songs typically that happen that made an impression on you in a difficult time in your life. There are some songs that when you hear them, they take you back to a place. I remember the song, I Need You Now. I Need You Now. There was a moment in life that was going through a difficult situation, and I needed God right now. And so when I hear that song, it takes me back to that place, but I look where I am today, and God brought me through. So it's, I need you, I need you. How'd it go? I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord, right now. I lift my hands. I bow my knees. I worship at your throne. I need you now. You know, and then there was just those, those fun songs, right? Uh, Don't Let the Devil Drive. You remember, anybody remember that? Don't Let the Devil Drive? Y'all know that? You too young for that? that? No, that's right. He ride the drive. Comes later. He said, Don't Let the Devil Ride. That's right. Don't Let the Devil Ride. Don't Let the Devil Ride. Why? Because if you let him ride, he'll want to drive. Don't let him ride. So de- be careful who you hang with. My grandma used to say, mind the company you keep. Be careful who you hang with, <laughs> right? Because you let them ride with you. They want to drive, right? So kind of fun song, but an important message. You know, and what, you know, one of my personal favorites, I love you, Jesus. Like when you think about who he is and what he's done for you, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. I lift my hands, I bow my knees, I worship at your throne. I need you, Lord. Get a medley for y'all, y'all. I'm ready to combine this. You see what I'm saying? But there are those moments, those songs. This train is a clean train. Y'all know nothing about that. This train is a clean train. Everybody riding in Jesus' name. This train don't carry no liars. Cigarette smokers or backbiters. Oh, my Lord, this train. See, y'all, like, what? Cigarette smokers? Right? This train got a holy motion. Riding this train is more than a notion. <laughs> Everybody ain't on this train. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But the point, even con- the communication of values through, through song, but what I have found is, you know, and I've been listening to, watching a lot of news and craziness with Washington and all of that and podcasts, but there's a place to just turn on some music and remind yourself of what God has done in your past. You think about it. Y'all don't know the song in the Church of God in Christ, we just is called this song called "Yay Lord." Now sometimes it meant y'all sit down, right? Folks shouting and all, run all the place. Yay Lord, sit down. It's time to preach, right? But other times, man, it was just, yes, Lord. And that song of surrender. And and some of y'all been in church services. That song would go on and seem like for hours, and folks falling out and crying and. Breaking that will where you didn't want to do something, but you say, yes, Lord. And who hasn't been touched by amazing grace? Or precious Lord, when you realize the story behind that, that man losing his, his wife and the child, and the, his wife dying in childbirth, and his wife and the, and the child dying, and him saying, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. You see, those songs were our therapy. 
You know, everybody, we haven't always had therapists, didn't always have insurance to get a therapist. <laughs> and again, there's nothing wrong with therapy. But there's something when it's you and the Lord and that word, that song, that rings in your heart, that transforms your life in those special songs. I think about my grandmother and my grandfather. My grandfather would start singing. And then folks, try, he'd be like, hey, that's my song. I didn't <laughs> y'all sing. It's my song, don't you? And folks want to take your verse and stuff, you know what I mean? They're like, that's my song. You know, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Got my war clothes on. My mother was a soldier, had a hand on the gospel plow. The day she got old, couldn't fight anymore. So I'll stand here and fight anyhow. <laughs> yeah, like, wow. <laughs> Betty, like, I wasn't no soldier. Right? <laughs> but the songs that we sing, and I would encourage you during the pandemic, I have found that in returning to the habit of listening and singing, to me, it's been motivational, it's been a joy. So maybe that's all somebody needed to hear today. But worship powerful. So Hebrews chapter 13, and this verse encapsulates this notion of worship as a lifestyle. It says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually, that means over and over and over, continually offer to God. And remember, worship is something that we're giving to God. You're not singing because somebody told you to sing. Typically doing praise and worship, y'all can't see me. My eyes are closed and, and I, I play air instruments all the time. <laughs> I play the air guitar, I play the keyboard. When I'm in my worship zone, because I can't play anything, but when I'm in my zone, I imagine myself being multi-talented as a musician. And I don't care what people think. <laughs> I know people who are in front of me, I'm doing my thing, they're like, this joker. But listen, I don't care. God likes to hear my air guitar. And my bass is just out of control. But it's not about you. It's about my relationship with my God. And the fact that it takes me a minute to find my key, he don't care. It's not about you. I'm not worshiping you, not singing to you. I'm singing to him and growing my relationship with us. So we continue off the God, a sacrifice of praise. And you see, the reason it's a sacrifice is because you have to make an effort because praise is not natural to us, and particularly for men, unless, of course, we're talking about sport, which is so funny, right? Men are funny about praise, but we wear other men's name on our Shirts, jump up and down about <laughs> what they do. You got to ask some, right? But when it comes to God, sometimes we get too cool. Well, I, I don't get in all that, but let our soccer team or our football team or our baseball team, hockey team, I guess, if, if they do something, we get all excited, yelling, screaming, we hugging each other, but then get cool about God? He says, listen, continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of your lips, that openly profess his name. You know, sometimes the enemy has to hear you call the name of Jesus. You have to hear yourself. We got any, any shower singers in here? Anybody in the shower just be echoed just right? You kill it. Fred got it. He's like, Fred, you should hear it. Fred in the shower. Right? <laughs> so the point is, the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, to profess his name. So worship is about God. It's about him. And so do not forget to do good. He said, this too is part of worship. It's what you do. It's not what you, just what you say. The fruit of your lips matters. He says, but then also do good. And then share with others for such sacrifices is what God is pleased with. And so worship is not just our words, but it's our walk and how we deal with our resources. See, when we give to other people, when we help people, that too is worship when we do good. That's worship. And so worship is a lifestyle that changes and characterizes how we live. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18. He says, rejoice always. Celebrate all the time. Lifestyle. Pray constantly. Not just in the morning when you get up, get on your knees. God, thank you. Help me. Do good for me. Bless me. Me, 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 me. Thank you. God, bye. He says, pray continually. And verse 18 says, give thanks in everything. Wow. In every situation, in every circumstance, in every difficulty, in everything that you're going through, he says, give thanks in everything. Why? Because you want to know what God's will is? It says, well, this is God's will for you in King Jesus. 
He says, you want to know what God's will? God, show me your will. God, teach me. God doesn't have to come up with a special will for you. He mapped out in his word already. He says, what I want you to hear is you really want to know God's will. He says, rejoice all the time. Pray all the time. Give thanks even in difficult and hard situations because you're saying, God, my relationship with you is not conditional on how I'm doing. My relationship with you is not conditional on your blessing me, quote unquote. You see, God can be blessing us by allowing us to go through things. God can be blessing us by giving us a testimony that's going to change the lives of other people. You see, God works differently than we do. He says his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. The way that we think about God, it's like babies, kids, right? Kids want to die to candy, cookies, and Kool-Aid. That's not good for them. That's not healthy for them. And so this is God's will that you would pray continually. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Let the message of Christ, the message of the kingdom, the good news of the gospel dwell within you, among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, through hymns, through spiritual songs. He says instruction even comes through music. Songs that come from the Spirit. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. God, I'm thankful. You know, so often we come to God asking because we don't spend enough time reflecting what he's already done. But when you come to God with gratitude, God, thank you for what you've done for me. God, when I, re when I reflect back, you see, when you reflect about what God has done for you in the past, situations in the, in, the, in the current don't look so dire because you're like, wait a minute. God has brought me through already. Many of us are doing better than we've ever done financially, even in terms of our physical health. And so when things come and we reflect back, when the doctor turned away and said, ah, I can't do anything else. Or when the bills were more than the money. We couldn't eat what we wanted to eat. We couldn't drive. Listen, at one time I drove the biggest thing in the road. Port Authority Transit. Anybody remember the bus? <laughs> Standing outside, waiting on the 88B to ride all the way down to St. Francis Hospital. Got off at midnight, was on the garbage shift, <laughs> waiting for the bus. And they get real funny around midnight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You ain't trying to miss that last bus. But to be able to fire up my own car. And come and go as I please. See, I, I, I didn't need a GPS till I got almost in my 30s. Because <laughs> I just went where the bus went. Let's be, y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. So anybody know, any, listen, only, any of y'all think the only way to get downtown was down Penn Avenue because that's the way the bus ran? <laughs> or, or you get on, you get on uh, what was it, the, the Hamilton, right? You thought the only, one to get, the only way to get downtown, you go down Hamilton, you turn, you get on Fifth Avenue, and then you run it. That's the only way I knew that you get downtown. The parkway, where the bus going to go on the parkway, I didn't know how to get downtown. But God has blessed us with transportation. Then we complain, I got to get some tires. What? <laughs> like, shut up. But when we worship him, and we express our gratitude, it says, verse 17, and whatever you do, whatever you do, whether in word, what you, what you sing, what you, what, you, what you say, or indeed do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Give thanks to God, the Father, through him. So when men worship, and we want to look at worshiping, look at worship through the eyes of three men. And the first of all, the first one is David. And David, the Bible says he was a worshiper. David is, is, is that guy. Say so he, he would worship and dance, and one time he was dancing, says he danced his clothes all off because he was dancing so hard because he was a worshiper. And so we find the worshiper, David the worshiper, man dove God, man dove. That's what church people say, man dove. That's one word, man dove God. This dude has slept with one of his soldiers' wives. No, he didn't sleep with her. He had sex with her. People kill. Sleep don't make babies. Y'all know that? That's a little, <laughs> sleep is not the problem. If people were just sleeping together, there really would be no problem. You see what I'm saying? You sleep whatever you want with. Don't matter who you sleep with. The problem is not sleeping. So David has sex with this woman. He's watching. He's, he's supposed to be at work. He's looking off his roof. He sees this woman bathing. We don't know the details of why she was out there bathing or why he was looking while she was bathing, why he didn't say go inside. He didn't say, ooh, 
let me go inside. I don't need to be out here. But he was watching her bathing. He calls for her. He has sex with her. She texts him and says, David, I'm pregnant. Life got real complicated. He calls, he calls for her husband, who is in the military, serving David, worshiper David, calls for her husband and gets him drunk and says, hey, man, go home with your wife, and then you go back to war. So he's David. This is worshiper David, King David. He's trying to set this dude up to go home and sleep with his wife so they can pretend like the baby is, is here. Dude says, King David, I'm insulted. I wouldn't dare go home and sleep with my wife while the king's soldiers are out in a war, in battle. I'm much too loyal to you, David, to do that. Who do you think I am? You imagine how David felt? What did it say? Like, lower than a snake's belly or something like this. It's like, whoa. So this dude doesn't go home. So then David writes a letter and sends it to the general and asks the dude to deliver the letter to the general. And in the letter, it says, put this guy on the front lines. David knew that he would be killed. This is worshiper David. King David. God's guy, David. And so the guy gets killed. David killed him secondarily, essentially. And so the woman's pregnant. They have this baby. The baby is sick. And David is brokenhearted. He's praying and fasting that the child will live. And so David is praying, fasting, crying out to the Lord, asking God to heal the child. You know, and this is that part where if we had written the Bible, it would be like, and the, and the child was healed. But that's not what happened. Verse 19 says, when David saw his servants whispering. So the servants are looking at David. David's on the floor crying out to God, fasting. He has eaten. It says, he knew that the baby was dead. So they asked him, is the baby dead? They answered, yes, he is dead. And then David got up from the floor, washed himself, put lotions on, changed his clothes. Then he went into the Lord's house to worship. And after that, he went home and asked for something to eat. The servants gave him food and something to eat. And so it's interesting. So David, because of his relationship with God, even though things didn't turn out the way he wanted them to, and even though he knew and the prophet had prophesied, David, what are you doing, man? You have access to any unmarried woman in the kingdom. You're the king. And you're going to take this guy's wife? What are you doing? And God pronounced, Nathan pronounced that God's punishment was going to be on David. But because David's relationship with God, even in his punishment, he accepted it. And he says, after the child died, he went and did what? He worshiped. Wow. And so the worshiper modeled for us. Even in the crisis, his relationship with God was not shaken. Because why? He was a worshiper when men worship. And then there's this guy, Job. Right? And, and now on the flip side, Job hadn't done anything. Right? So this is what I'm saying. Worship is a lifestyle irrespective of the circumstance or the situation. Job hadn't done anything. The Bible, in fact, says Joseph was a righteous and upright man. It says he was perfect in the sense that he was morally upright. And so Job is having the worst day in the whole history of the world. His animals are lost, his stuff is burned down, and then finally, it says, while he was still speaking, another servant came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Can't imagine being Job, but watch this, verse 20. And then Job arose. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He fell on the ground and did what? And worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now, Job misread the situation. He didn't know that Satan had been given permission to destroy, to jack up his life. 
And so he said, God gave, God took away. So again, he misappropriated or misunderstood the source of his pain, but it didn't matter. It says in all of that, he blessed the name of the Lord. So when you find yourself in difficult situations, is your relationship with God so intimate that you're able to still worship? And Job did not sin. And so the king, king, key kingdom principle this morning, when combined with fasting and prayer, worship is warfare. We're going to talk about Jehoshaphat real quickly. 1053, oh boy. All right, let's, let's, let's jump in it. I think I'm going to move forward kind of quickly. Uh, but the situation, well, I'll give you the background. So the situation is King Jehoshaphat, he's the king. Life is pretty good. And then he gets news that these three other nations are going to, on their way, not going to, they're on their way to attack the children of Israel. And he's not prepared. He didn't have beef with these guys. It's like you find out at school, you're going to get jumped. You know what I'm saying? You hear that them three tough kids are waiting for you after school and going to jump you. And so he's like, what in the world? It says Jehoshaphat was afraid. Verse 3. Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to what? Seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast in all of Judah. And the Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. All the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So Jehoshaphat was like, I'm in a crisis situation. I need to call on the Lord. And so we said prayer combined with fasting is powerful. So he understood that. So he called the fast, and the people assembled. And then what happens? They came together and prayed. And then Jehoshaphat reminds God of who he is. He says, God, you promised that if we would seek you, that you would help us, that you would intervene on our behalf, that you would be of assistance. Because of what? Jehoshaphat had a relationship with God. And if you read it toward the end of the chapter, it says he obeyed God like his father Asa. So because when you are confident of your relationship with God, even in the crisis, even in the middle of what's going on, I think about the folks in Texas, no power, no light, all kinds of going, when you have a relationship with God, you are confident in your ability to call out to him, knowing that he will hear you. And so he had called the fast, and they prayed, and they were seeking God. And so the verse that I like so much, verse 12, he says, God, won't you intervene for us? Won't you execute judgment on those for coming against us? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. Have you ever found yourself in a situation, in a circumstance, life bring you to the point where you don't know what to do? You lost a loved one. You get a little note from work. You don't have a job anymore. You're sick. Find yourself in crisis. You get a, get a test that you wasn't prepared for. I was at a meeting this week, and they're like, Dr. Wallace, we're so glad that you're here today to present to us. I was like, oh, <laughs> Dr. Wallace was just here to listen. He didn't know he was here to present. So I threw up a quick prayer, ran to the stack of PowerPoint slides, threw that thing up, and God did his thing. God, we don't know what to do, but we're watching. We're looking, expecting you to intervene. And so they prayed, and then one of the prophets came. Verse 13, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their wives and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, son of Jeel, and son of Mattaniah, a Levite, and so forth. And what we find is he prophesied, says, God got this. Don't worry about it. Verse 17 says, You will not need to fight this battle, stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. You see what I'm saying? He flips this thing. He says, they coming at you. He says, you go against them. Y'all ain't gonna have to fight no way. Y'all just go watch. I want to give you front row. I'm buying y'all front row tickets to watch this thing go down. And so they go from afraid, and what are we going to do? God gives the answer. He says, y'all don't have to fight, but y'all go. I want to show y'all something. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them. <laughs> the people who were coming at you, he said, you go against them. The armies that were going to overwhelm, he said, y'all go against them. And the Lord 
will be with you. He says, your relationship with me, I heard your prayer, and the relationship that you have with me and that I have with you, that's what's going to make the thing happen tomorrow when it goes down. In verse 18, watch this, and Jehoshaphat, what, bowed his head with his face to the ground. All Judah and the heavens of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord, what, worshiping the Lord. Face down, worshiping the Lord. Watch this. And then the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites, they stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud voice. God spoke. They worshiped. They bowed down. Then they stood up and they praised. That God's going to do what he, only he can do. He said, the fear is gone. So when you find yourself in that crisis situation, you see when your worship is right and when your relationship with God is strong, you can be like David and worship in a situation that you created. It didn't work out how you wanted, but you say, God, okay, I'm still going to worship you. Brother Job didn't do anything, but he believed, he knew that God was with him. He knew God loved him. He was able to worship. In this case, they prayed, they fasted, they sought the Lord. God answered, and they had a confidence, sense of knowing that it's going to be all right. Why? Because God said it's going to be all right. I'm confident that because of my relationship with him, and so they were able to stand and pray. And so then in the next day, verse 20, they rose early and went out into the wilderness. They went out and Jehoshaphat said, hear me, Judah, and have it in Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. You see, the prayer and what God spoke, Jehoshaphat, it was no longer, God, we're worried. I don't know what to do. I'm looking, depending on you. He had received the word, and so now his confidence was up, his relationship. And when he worshiped and reflected on what God had done, oftentimes before I have a, 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 a big talk and a large audience or something, or even before I preach on Sunday, listen to some music. Get, you know, they got those songs to get you ready. I listen to John P. Key. If I'm trying to get hype, John P. Key will make you drive too fast, though, don't you? Listen to John P. Key on the highway. he make you drive too fast. But you get, man, John P. Key, he gets you hype, and then I'm like, okay, let's go. Showtime. Let's get it, man. And so that confidence that comes in remembering who God is and reflecting on what he's done in your past. And so he had confidence. Remember, he's the leader. If the king is like, oh, Lord, y'all. I don't know what we finna do. That's where he started, and that was okay. But then he got the confidence because the Lord spoke. And he knew what was going to happen. And so he went out and said, hear me, Judah, and have in Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and what? You will succeed. And this is the craziest thing right here. When you think of military you know, we think, so the, the Marines go in first to soften them up. Then you send the army and all this. And so the strategy, he does something that is very strange. It says, and when he had taken counsel with the people, he explained to them what God was saying. He appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. So dude is talking to the choir. Like, hold up, we finna battle. We, we, we're about to go into war. This dude puts the choir out front, the worshipers. You see, and so... Often worship precedes warfare. In fact, worship is warfare. When you worship in total commitment to God and you know what he said, and so he puts these guys, the singers, he puts them in the holy time and he says, they went before the army. And he says, here's what y'all supposed to say. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Watch this in verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise the Lord. And when they began to sing and praise, it says the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. It says when they prayed and worshiped, then the Lord went into action. They prayed, they fasted, they said, God, we need your help. We weren't even ready for this battle. God's like, no problem, you ain't going to fight, no way. He says, but what I want y'all to do is set it up. So you send out the, the show enough warriors, the Marines, the warriors. And when they began to sing, it says God set an ambush. And so when worship is warfare, if you believe that God got you, and you've prayed and you fasted, some of the things you're praying and fasting for, you don't even have to do nothing. You just need to watch worship. This is crazy. And they began to sing and praise. The Lord set an ambush. Verse 20. The men, in Anon, the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So there's three groups. There's Ammon, 
There's the Moabites, and there's the guys from Mount Seir. And it says the two, Moab and Ammon, they rose against the Mount Seir guys, devoting them to destruction. So the two of them jumped the one group that was coming to attack the, the, the children of Israel, says they fought each other. This is crazy. And when they had made the end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. And so they're singing and watching. They're like, this is crazy. What, what were they singing again? What were they singing? Told them to sing. Give thanks to the Lord. Step back. Yeah. And his steadfast love endures forever. So they're singing, give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. And they're watching these guys killing each other. And it says they all help to destroy one another. Insane. It says, when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they came down from where they were watching. They looked toward the horde, and behold, there were bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. So the last two cats were fighting each other, and they killed each other, and that was that. These three armies that a few verses ago Jehoshaphat was worried about extinguished themselves, and they didn't lift not a sword, not a baseball bat, not a nothing. And no one escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them a great number of goods, clothing, and precious things. They looked for themselves until they could carry it. They took for themselves. They, could. they were three days taking the spoil. It was so much. It took them three days to take the stuff from a battle that they didn't even fight. He says, y'all watch, and then y'all get your, your energy together because it's going to take you three days to take the riches from these people that you didn't even have to battle. And on the fourth day, they, watch this, they assembled in the Valley of Berica, for there they blessed the Lord. They worshiped him. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Berica to this day. And then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat at their head, returning Jews. They left with fear. They left with trepidation. They left afraid, and they come back to the city with swag, cocky whole bunch of stuff that they didn't have. And they came to Jerusalem, watch this, with harps and lyres and trumpets. They had a band, y'all, <laughs> the drum line. They came back with confidence, with stuff. And the fear of God came on all the kings of the country when they heard the Lord had fought against the enemy. And verse 30 says, and so the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for God gave him rest all around. The power worship. It says, and then God gave him peace. So in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your fretting around COVID-19, maybe, just maybe, you might want to take a little bit more time. You might be praying, you might be fasting, but there might be the missing ingredient of worship. That song that inspires you. You know, how great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? Right? You're like, wait a minute, how great is our God? What? And so the things that we worry about, man, might just be a matter of worship. So I want to encourage you this week. You know, and, and here's the thing. I'm talking about God music. You see, we listen to a whole bunch of stuff, but the, those, and, and all quote-unquote Christian music is not God music either. But those songs that use the words of the scripture and remind us who God is. Get in the habit. Put your headphones on. Turn it up loud if you want to. But worship may be the warfare that you need to break out of the situation. I was reading, and what happens when we sing, the impact on our brain, it says music and worship is literally therapeutic, reduces anxiety, depression. It says it even works with children with autism, helps Therapy, music therapy with people who are addicted. The power of music. And then when you overlay some Jesus and begin singing those words of faith, what faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Much of the Bible, in particular the Psalms, are songs. 
And so begin to sing the words of the Lord. And I'm pretty confident it will change your thinking. You know, so maybe less podcasts, less news. And begin to worship. Try it out. Guarantee it. It'll change your situation. And if it doesn't change the situation, it'll change you. So either way, change takes place. And then we can walk according to God's will for us. And we can experience the abundant life that is our right as children of the king. Today, maybe there's someone who you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And when life overwhelms you, you don't know what to do. And so today, I want to encourage you to discover this thing called worship. When you present your life, the lifestyle of giving your life to Jesus, everything changes. The the word says if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, boss, CEO, king, believe in our heart that Christ raised him from the dead. Because then if Jesus is our Lord, we begin to act like it. (laughs) We walk like that. We live like it. So there's no magic in the words. But the key is in the living and seeing him as your king and realizing that what Jesus did on the cross He paid the price for your sins and mine so you can be restored to a right relationship with the creator of the universe, the one that you can call on. In the midst of your challenge and your difficulty, he will step in and change your life. And then for those of us who are already believers, some of us, maybe you stop, you don't listen to music as much as you used to. You've gotten distracted. But I would say during this time in particular, you know, some of y'all got them eight tracks, still got the eight track player. Go on, plug that thing in. Fast forward a little bit. Some of y'all got cassettes. Y'all remember cassettes? Some of y'all might have 78. <laughs> got cassettes. Listen to the CDs. Then you know they got these new things. I don't have my, the, my device, but they got this thing now where you can actually put the songs on your phone. Have a whole concert right there on your phone. Hours and hours of music. Put, because the stuff that we hear, you see, it influences our thinking. And our brain responds to that stuff. And so when you're singing, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than changes you, man. You know, it starts like this. It says, I lift my hands in total adoration to you. You reign on the throne. Lord, you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you this song. I just want to say that I love you more than me. And so you get a picture of Jesus on the throne, controlling, orchestrating, mastering your life. Those challenges, those difficulties, those things that overwhelm you. He's on the throne and he can just speak. You're reading along with us and we saw a few days ago in the reading, Jesus is out on the water and it's crazy and the water's coming in the ship and Jesus is asleep. And like, Jesus, you don't care. We're about to drown. And Jesus is like, huh, what What is going on? (laughs) And then he gets up and the rains and the the winds and the, the way, and Jesus says, peace, be still. And they say, what manner of man is this? And so when you're singing, you're saying, that guy, <laughs> the one who speaks to the storm and gets up and talks to the weather, say, hey, knock it off. I'm trying to sleep. You're making all this noise. These guys yelling and screaming, waking me up. What is wrong with y'all? Y'all thought it was about the disciples, about Jesus. He's like, y'all messing with my nap. But that's who we say. 
We sing it too, you know what I mean? He's like, he reigns on the throne, leave God and God alone. So your cloudy days, they're gone. That's why I say I love you, Jesus. More than anything. So let's pray. If you don't have a relationship with Christ today, I want you to get one. Say, I want to experience that abundant life. I want to know that Jesus this guy is talking about. If you haven't been worshiping and you got caught up in the craziness in D.C. and what's going on and all over the world, you're all stressed and pressed and, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Listen, recenter, get focused, worship. Remind yourself of who God is, the king on the throne. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we come to you today. Remind ourselves of the power of worship as a lifestyle. So whether life is up or down, good or bad, we worship you. Our lifestyle is one of worship. And we're reminded of who you are. There's no circumstances, no situation. There's nothing that you can't handle. And so God, if there's one today who doesn't know you, Father, we encourage them to just ask you to come in, take over, take charge, control of their life. Believe what you did on the cross was enough to pay the price for their sins. And then, God, those of us who already know you, but we get distracted. Lord God, we repent and we restore. And God, throughout the remainder of these days, in particular in the middle of this pandemic, God, we want to go back to worship and listening and hearing your voice through your word, through prayer, and through music. To restore our confidence so we can be like our God, Jehoshaphat. From fearful to frightening, confident, zealous, and about the business of the kingdom. So we love you today. We exalt you, God. We honor you. We glorify you. We give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. We pray this prayer now in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus Christ, our King. If you gave your life to Christ today, I'd ask you to put it in the chat. I love Jesus. And someone will follow up with you, put your contact information. We would love to reach out to you and help you on the next steps in your journey and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ.